Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to discuss what you need to know about measles, including what causes it, risk factors for getting measles, transmission of measles, stages of infection, and signs and symptoms of measles. So measles is caused by an infection by the measles virus, so that's easy to remember, which is itself a member of the viral family Paramyxoviridae. So these viruses, the measles virus, is an enveloped positive sense single-stranded RNA virus. A lot of key words there. So they have an envelope. They are positive sense single-stranded RNA viruses. And the measles virus is also known as a morbilla virus. And a morbilla virus is a virus that causes a morbilliform rash. And we're going to talk about what a morbilliform rash is a little later on. Now what's very, very important to understand about the measles virus is that it is highly contagious. And it's estimated that around 90% of individuals who are exposed to it will become infected by it. So this is a very, very contagious virus. And there are certain th key characteristics about the measles virus. There are characteristic prodromal symptoms and a subsequent characteristic exanthem or a rash. And we're going to talk about all those details in the next upcoming slides. Now, with the advent of vaccines, a lot of the measles morbidity and mortality has decreased, but we still have significant mortality from measles. And the WHO estimates that approximately 140,000 people worldwide have died of measles in the year 2018. So what are some of the risk factors for getting measles? So the risk factors for getting measles include having a deficiency of vitamin A. Another risk factor is malnutrition. So this kind of ties in with vitamin A deficiency. Another one is being immunocompromised. So this makes sense. If you're immunocompromised, your immune system is low or it's not as functional as it should be, you're more likely to become infected with a variety of viruses, including the measles virus. A fourth risk factor is being a pregnant woman. For whatever reason, pregnant women are more likely to have measles or have a worse presentation of measles. And Another risk factor is what we call the extremes of age. So being very young or being very old. So being very young and being very old are risk factors for contracting measles and having a worse presentation of measles. So how is the measles virus transmitted? We talked about this before. It is a very contagious virus and it's transmitted by a couple of different mechanisms. One is that it's transmitted through human-to-human -human contact via respiratory droplets. And another way that it can be transmitted is through airborne mechanisms. And this is really where it becomes very contagious. So it's less than five microns, so it's very hard to filter. And it can remain in the air for up to two hours. So this, once someone with measles goes into an environment, they can shed the virus out and into the environment into the air and that virus can remain there for hours. So this is why it is extremely contagious. And this all ties in with the infectious period, the period of time in which an individual who has measles can transmit it and infect other people. So the infectious period is estimated to be from five days before the rash starts up to four days after the rash has started. So there's this period of time when people with measles can infect others. So how does it actually infect someone? So if there's measles viruses in the air, it's airborne, or it's in droplets, an individual can come into contact with them and the virus can enter into a variety of areas, particularly in the face. So the mucous membranes are where the virus enters. So mucous membranes like the eyes, the conjunctiva of the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. Then the virus can multiply, and it then enters into regional lymph nodes, where it then starts to multiply even more. From those regional lymph nodes, it can enter into the bloodstream. And this is when we get what we call the first viremia. Viremia means virus in the blood. Emia is blood. Vire means virus. Then it starts to multiply in the blood even more. And then it starts to spread to other cells. So it spreads to cells like macrophages and a variety of other cells. And then it can enter into the skin and cause infection in the skin. 
and then the virus can multiply in these sites and then enter the blood again, causing what we call a second viremia. So there's a first viremia, there's a little bit of a, a lull in the viral load, and then there's another second viremia, and this is when we actually start to see symptoms. So what are the clinical features? What are the symptoms of measles? There are actually four stages of infection of measles. Stage one is the incubation stage. And as his name suggests, we essentially get infected with the virus and the virus incubates in our body. And this incubation period lasts for six to 21 days. And usually the median time of incubation is around 13 days. During this stage of infection, we are often asymptomatic. Although individuals who are in stage one can have some mild symptoms, they may have an onset of a fever or some other prodromal symptoms we're gonna talk about in the next stage. Stage two is the prodrome. It is the prodromal stage of infection. This stage occurs for about two to four days and it can last up to eight days. In this stage, we see a fever, we see malaise, so individuals are very tired and we see anorexia. They don't have much of an appetite. The fever can be very high. It can go up to 40 degrees Celsius. And there are three C's in the prodromal stage of infection. What do I mean by three C's? This is how we can remember some of these characteristic signs and symptoms of the prodromal stage of measles. So the three C's are conjunctivitis. So that's one C and it's a non-purulent bilateral conjunctivitis. The second C is coryza. So maybe a stuffy, runny nose. And the third is cough. So again, conjunctivitis, so the conjunctiva are inflamed and there's what we call conjunctival injections. We see coryza, stuffy, runny nose, and we see a cough. Those are the three C's of the prodromal stage of infection of measles. The next stage of infection is stage three, the exanthem stage. So what is an exanthem? An exanthem is a presentation or an eruption of a dermatological finding. It is essentially a widespread rash, and that's what an exanthem is. But really before that happens, we get something called coplic spots. So coplic spots occur prior to the exanthem. They're still in stage three, but they occur before the exanthem happens. So what are coplic spots? So coplic spots are essentially little findings that we see inside the buccal mucosa when we look inside the mouth. So if an individual has measles, you check inside their mouth, you look in the sides or the buccal mucosa, so the sides of their mouth. So here's a tongue and it's on the sides. What we see are white, gray, or blue spots on an erythematous base. So you can see here, there's an erythematous base, very mild erythematous base with little white spots. And sometimes they're described as grains of salt. So you can think of it as grains of salt being kind of thrown onto a bit of a red area. And that's kind of how they are described. And the coplic spots usually occur 48 hours prior to the actual official exanthem, the official dermatological rash that occurs in measles. And the coplic spots last upwards of 72 hours. Now the coplic spots don't always happen with measles or you might not catch them, but if you see coplic spots, you essentially have the diagnosis of measles. So always important to check inside the mouth. Now the actual exanthem is the maculopapular rash that occurs about two to four days after the fever has started in that prodromal stage. So the maculopapular rash is a rash that is composed of macules and papules. So macules and papules are essentially little reddened areas that are little spots that are usually less than one centimeter. Some of them are flat and some of them are raised. That is what a maculopapular rash is. So you can see here on these images on the torso, you can see this rash occurring. And this rash is described as morbilliform. So we talked about morbilla virus and 
Here is the word that also describes the rash, morbilliform. So why do we use this? So morbilliform is essentially the word we use to describe rashes from measles. So it's more specific to measles. If we were to say morbilliform rash, we are essentially saying that it is measles-like in its look or in its characteristics. So it's a maculopapular rash on the trunk. So if we were to break this word down into prefix and suffix, morbilliform really doesn't mean what we're describing. Morbili, the prefix morbili, means disease. It comes from the Latin morbus, which means disease. You can think of morbidity, mortality, those types of words. Form really means what it looks like, the characteristic. So it's kind of a disease look or a disease characteristic. It doesn't really mean what we're describing here, but just recognize that when we use the word morbilliform, we're describing a measles rash. That is what we're talking about when we use that word. Some other characteristics of this rash include that the rash is first blanchable. So what early on when the rash first starts, if you were to push on the red spot of the rash and let go, it would be blanchable, which means it, the red spot or the redness goes away. But as the rash progresses and the longer the rash goes on for, it becomes non-blanchable. So later on, if you were to push on the same spot, the redness doesn't go away and essentially becomes non-blanchable. And there's a characteristic pattern to this rash. The rash starts on the face, then spreads down the neck, the trunk, upper arms or upper extremities, and then onto the lower extremities or the legs. So it goes from top to bottom, head to toe. That is how this rash progresses. That's very important to understand about this rash. Starts on the face and spreads downward. So it's a head to toe, top to bottom rash. And another key important characteristic of this rash is that the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet are not affected. So again, rash starts on the head, spreads down, head to toe, top to bottom, and the palms and soles are not affected. So even more things that happen in stage three include the following. Lymphadenopathy. So lymphadenopathy is swollen, tender lymph nodes. Other things we can see in this stage is pharyngitis or a sore throat. We may also see splenomegaly or an enlarged spleen. And we can also see diarrhea. So they can have some GI upset or gastrointestinal upset. And we can also see some continuation of those prodromal symptoms we talked about before. So we can still see conjunctivitis, coryza, or cough. In order to remember, you can think of coplic as another C. So you can think of the four Cs, coryza, conjunctivitis, cough, and coplic spelled with a C, if that helps you remember. And as the rash progresses, the rash darkens to a brown color about three to four days after it had initially erupted. And then the rash fades in the same pattern that it had started or it had erupted in. So it fades from head to toe, top to bottom, and then it desquamates in some instances. So desquamates essentially just kind of gets flaky and flakes off. And then the fourth stage is the recovery stage. Improvement of symptoms usually occurs about 48 hours after the rash occurs. So once that rash occurs, within 48 hours, a lot of these symptoms start to improve. And then the rash darkens and then fades from head to toe. But even after the symptoms have improved and we're in the recovery stage, we may still have post-infectious symptoms. Some of these include a cough, a post-infectious cough. And the cough can last for weeks. Now, there are two other clinical presentations of measles I want to quickly discuss. The first one is modified measles. Modified measles is an attenuated measles infection. It is, you can think of it as diet measles. It's a reduced and milder form of measles that occurs in someone who has partial immunity, either because they were infected before or they had some kind of vaccination that is waning. So what happens in these individuals is that they're partially immune, so they can kind of fight off the measles virus a bit better, but they can still become infected. The incubation period is longer. It's usually 17 to 21 days. They have the same symptoms that we talked about earlier, but they're less severe and the individuals are less contagious. So even if they are partially immune and they get infected, they are less contagious, which protects other people around them. And the second 
clinical presentation I want to talk about is atypical measles. You're not really going to hear about this one. This is a very rare presentation. It only occurs in individuals who are vaccinated in the United States between 1963 and 1967 with a specific vaccine. So some older patients. And what happens in these individuals is that if they were vaccinated during those time period and they haven't had any other vaccinations and they get infected with measles, they actually have a worse presentation and they have certain complications, including vasculitis and pneumonitis. So if you want to learn more about the many complications of being infected by measles, including some that are fatal, and you want to learn about the ways we can diagnose, treat, and prevent becoming infected with measles, please check out my second lesson on measles, and that will be linked here. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. As always, continue to live, laugh, and learn, and I hope to see you next time.